Hello everyone, thank you for coming. I'm Denny Dreyer and I am one of the co-coordinators for Pax Christi, Maine. And I welcome you as we join people around the world who are making the 75th anniversary of the first use of nuclear weapons in war a priority in our consciousness in this week. The atomic bombings of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima on August 6th and of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945. So several of the main peace groups that are co-sponsoring this event, Peace Action Maine, where'd Martha go? And Martha, uh, Martha and, Sk and Stan Scott are here to um, represent them. I'm here for Pax Christi, the main chapter of Veterans for Peace. David, is somewhere? Oh, there you are. <laughs> um, Peace Works of Brunswick, who will be doing another program tomorrow. And the main chapter of WILP, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I especially want to thank Martha Spies of Peace Action, who has done most of the initiating, envisioning, and detail work to enable us to gather at this time. And she's well known to most of us due to her most almost ubiquitous presence with her video camera at a wide range of events promoting peace, justice, equality, etc. Thank you, Martha. Not physically with us here today are three outstanding women who have contributed greatly to the work of Maine's peace community over many years. Christine Detroit, an ardent member of WILF, sent a message with her regrets that she couldn't be here. She was the driving force behind the annual peace fair held in Brunswick for 15 years, which ended last year. In her message sent to us today, she shares that since its founding in De Haag, Holland in 1915, Wilp describes, describes its mission as being messengers of peace. Thanks go to Christine for the copies of the summer's edition of Peace and Freedom magazine with its beautiful cover of peace cranes. Freedom and justice. It's, and, and she says, today's world needs to be changed by millions of messengers of peace. Given the world's addiction to war, the work for peace, freedom, and justice is too important to be ignored by the governed. She invites all of us to join women and men across the world as active messengers of peace, resolving never to forget the horror of war as we live and work to replace it with a vision and mission of peace and justice, because it is possible. Secondly, many of you have known Suki Rice, who sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago after a struggle with cancer. I first knew Suki during my early days in Maine in the late 1970s, when we were involved with the American Friends Service Committee and then worked together on the national freeze, nuclear freeze campaign in Maine. In more recent years, Suki's energy focused on the climate crisis, as well as support for a school in Kenya. We have heard that her passing was undertaken with the same grace and love with which she lived. We're grateful for the gift of her life as a peace worker among us and offer our sympathy to her husband and family. And also, recently taken from us, was Christina, or Tina Malcolmson. Stan Scott will share a few words about Tina. Thanks, Denny. And thanks to you and Pax Christie for holding the Hiroshima Day Memorial. Nothing seems more fitting 
to this memorial in emphasis on Pax Christi places on nonviolence. Can you hear me okay? Raise your hand if you can. One of his great speeches, Martin Luther King, alluding to the very, as he very often did to Gandhi, said in effect, what we face today, and that includes today in 2020, is not a choice between nonviolence and violence. It's a choice between nonviolence and non-existence. In the light of the great principle of nonviolence, I've been asked to say a few words about my close friend and partner for several years on the board of Peace Action Maine, Tina Malcolmson, who died suddenly at her home in Portland from an accidental fall down her basement stairs while carrying a box of books. Personal note, I had just had lunch from one of the food trucks on the Eastern Prom with Tina and a very good talk a few days before when I heard of her sudden passing on July 16th. Well, that's when I heard of it. We don't know the exact date. It was probably the 11th. I just learned that Bob Dale and Sufi Rice had also recently passed, so I'd like to acknowledge that good friendship with Bob Dale as well. I had known Tina since the 70s in Berkeley where we had both been students at different times. After I moved to Portland around 2009 or 10, Tina asked me if I'd like to visit the meeting of the Peace Action of Maine Board. And that was the start of our work with PAM. Eventually we became co-chairs. Then she took over the job of treasurer and I became chair. Close and pretty wonderful working relationship for a number of years. Talking on the phone weekly and planning agenda for each monthly meeting of the board, including our sponsorship of a training in nonviolent resistance. We brought a crowd of around 125 people and lectures on Gandhi and nonviolence by Gandhi scholar and activist Doug Allen. Several years, Tina was among the strongest voices in PAM for the vibrancy and stability of the organization, working very smartly and keeping us on track as treasurer of the organization. Uh, I was constantly inspired by her clarity of mind and purpose, her great work ethic, and uh, her profound ethical standards, political insight and high level of commitment to important causes related to the peace movement, the need to end U.S. involvement in war and the war economy, racial and economic justice in the U.S., equal rights among the Palestinian, equal rights of the Palestinian people in Israel and the surrounding territories, gender equality in, the main, in Maine and the U.S., etc. Besides her work with PAM, Tina was also an active at different times with the Center for Ma uh, uh, the, with Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights and the Maine, uh, Southern Maine Workers Center, which held an informal memorial for her on the Western Prom a few days after her passing. She will be greatly missed. Um, if any of you are interested in attending, there will be a Zoom gathering uh, to celebrate her life and uh, give each other mutual support and her loss on, at 3 p.m. on August 30th, which is a Saturday, sponsored by me and a mutual friend of Tina's and mine, Liz Muser of Bowdoin College and Tina's only surviving relative, um, Peter Malcolmson, who uh, doesn't, doesn't live here. He, he's a, a retired professor in, the, in uh, Detroit. Let me know if you'd like to be on the list for the Zoom invitation, uh, and I, I can put you on my list. Uh, we can also put the link up on the PAM website, where you may check, I think, in the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Stan. We now turn, oops, I better take this off.
We now turn from the present sadness of our acknowledgement of the loss of two members of our main peace community and return in our imagination or for some memory to the deaths and losses of 75 years ago that drew us together here today. The world was deeply involved in a terrible war in which massive amounts of powerful weapons were already wreaking huge amounts of death and destruction in Europe, Asia, and Africa. But on July 16, 1945, when the first atomic bomb was detonated at the Trinity test site in the New Mexico desert, a giant leap forward was made in mankind's destructive capability. And then, as President Truman said later, we designed the bomb, we built the bomb, we used the bomb. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were two of the five cities that met the official criteria for possible U.S. A-bomb targets. Cities with, albeit limited, military functions and densely packed workers' homes. At 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945, the little boy atomic bomb was detonated over Shima Hospital in Hiroshima. Its fireball equaled the heat of the sun and was 18,000 feet in diameter. In the first second, every, everyone within a two-mile radius was exposed to a deadly radioactive wave, which was followed by a massive blast wave, which destroyed nearly every building in the city. And then came the heat wave which ignited fires across the region and set everything flammable into flames. People in the hypocenter were vaporized instantly, including all but a few of the 544 students from the first Hiroshima Municipal Girls High School who were helping clear rubble in an area over a thousand feet away. Survivors, the Hibakusha, recall a nuclear hell with the dying crying out, give me water. People so badly burned that their eyeballs and skin hung from their bodies. Severely burned people drowning as they climbed into cisterns or the city's rivers in a futile effort to ease their pain. Hibakusha Futaba Kitayama, then a 33-year-old housewife, reports turning to look as someone shouted, oh, that's a parachute, a parachute's coming down. She says, just at that moment, the sky I was facing flashed. I do not know how to describe that light. I wondered if a fire had been set in my eyes. It was something like an ominous purple-like color of sparks caused by a streetcar at night, only a billion times stronger. I don't remember which came first, the flash of light or the sound of an explosion that roared down to my belly. Anyway, the next moment I was knocked down on the ground. Immediately things started falling down around my head and shoulders. I couldn't see anything. It seemed pitch dark. I thought the destined final moment now had come. She then describes the vision she had of her three children who had been evacuated to the countryside and her determination not to die because she had to take care of her children. As she crawled out somehow from under the debris and her shock at the feeling that the skin of her face had come off on her handkerchief and then the hands and arms too. From elbow to fingertips, all the skin of my right hand came off and hung down grotesquely. The skin of my left hand all five fingers also came off. And then, starting to run frantically, she could find no landmarks, no streets. But seeing the Surumi, Surumi Bridge, she turned toward it. But what I saw under the bridge was shocking. Hundreds of people were squirming in the stream. I couldn't tell if they were men or women. They all looked alike. 
Their faces were swollen and gray. Their hair was standing up, holding their hands high, groaning. People were rushing to the river. I felt the same urge because the pain was all over my body, which had been exposed to a heat ray strong enough to burn my pants to pieces. I was about to jump into the river, only to remember that I could not swim. With that image, let us hear Tamiki Hara's poem, Give Me Water, which will follow with a moment of silence. Give me water. Oh, give me water to drink. Let me have some. I would rather to die. To die. Oh, help me. Oh, help me. Water. A bit of water. I beg you, won't anyone? Oh, 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 the heavens split, the streets are gone, the river, the river flowing on, oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Night, night coming on. To these eyes parched and sear, to these lips inflamed. Ah, the moaning of a man, of a man reeling, his face scorched, smarting this ruined face of a man. Futaba then describes some of the horrible scenes she viewed as she went back up on the bridge how her burns started paining her, and how next to her many junior high school students, boys and girls, also volunteers, were squirming in agony. They were crying insanely. Mother, mother. They were so severely burned and bloodstained that one could scarcely dare to look at them. But once I looked at this cruel sight, a rage came up. Why? Why these children? I didn't know at whom I should direct this rage. I could do nothing for them, but watch them die one by one, seeking their mothers in vain. In the days that followed, Thousands who initially appeared to have survived began dying from radiation poisoning. <clears throat> and by year's end, an estimated 120,000 people had died from the single A-bomb. Yet three days later, at 11.02 a.m., the Nagasaki A-bomb was detonated over Urakami Cathedral, the largest church in Asia. Exploding more than a mile from its target, portions of the city were shielded from the most devastating impacts of the bomb. But most could not escape the second nuclear holocaust, and by year's end, more than 70,000 had perished. To this day, Hiroshima and Nagasaki Eibanga survivors, the Hibakusha, continue to suffer and die from radiation and other A-bomb related illnesses. And with their children and grandchildren to suffer from the physical and psychological effects of the bombing. They also continue speaking out about the horrors of nuclear weapons and calling for a ban on them. 
Never again, they continue to say to the world. As the number of survivors still here to tell their stories grows fewer, efforts are being made to keep their plea before the world. You can help do that by adding your name to their petition, which is indicated on the handout we gave you or will give you. And they are not the only nuclear survivors. Consider also the downwinders who grew up near the U.S. nuclear testing and production sites, including Utah, New Mexico, and Washington. The people of the Marshall Islands who endured 12 years of U.S. nuclear testing and continue to face the negative health consequences of those tests years later. The U.S. military veterans sent to observe nuclear tests and clean up nuclear waste who have fought for years for compensation for the harm they've suffered. And the uranium workers who mined the raw materials to make nuclear weapons, often on indigenous lands, without ever being told of the severe health risks involved. And just think that there was an initial ban on reporting or photographing the results of the Hiroshima bomb. My personal story and why I am here today, I was an adult married with two small children before my consciousness was pierced with the reality of the atomic bomb story through reading the Hippoxia stories. We lived for a year in St. Louis, Missouri. It was 1975 and the 30th anniversary of the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombings. For many of those 30 years, the St. Louis Friends Meeting, the Quakers, which we attended while there, had held commemorative events. I attended the initial meeting to plan for that year's event. And somehow, my suggestion was to hold an all-night, mostly silent vigil, interrupted every hour by a reading found favor, and I was asked to choose the readings. I was at that time really quite ignorant about the events, having only been exposed to the basic news reporting and newsreels at the movie theater. I could envision the, the bombs, the cloud, the mushroom cloud, etc. But I really didn't know what I know now. So I came home from the local branch of the St. Louis Public Library with an armful of books that explored the subject from just about every imaginable viewpoint. And I spent the next few weeks immersed in reading them while offering my husband extra opportunities to spend time with our two young sons. But the book that seared into my memory and established my commitment to work for the abolition of all nuclear weapons was psychologist Robert J. Lifton's Death in Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, which was stories from the Hibakusha. I was horrified. I would look at my children and see the skin falling from their arms. The vigil took place on a street corner covered with demolition rubble. I don't remember how we found that spot, but we did. And we gathered from about 11 a.m. the time of the Nagasaki bombing until 8.15 the next morning, the time of the Hiroshima bomb. The corner was on a bus route, and our large signs indicating our reason for being there were seen by many. And then a bus stopped, and a woman got off and almost ran toward us. She was a Hibakusha. She was so startled to see that we were there remembering what happened. She remained with us for a couple of hours before having to return to her family. And then somehow, we learned that Dick Gregory, who some of you may remember, was performing in town. So we sent a messenger to invite him to join us, which he managed to do for our closing circle in the morning. And I remember him telling us that in his travels around the world, where he would fast for periods of time and meet with peace groups and calling for an end to war and to nuclear weapons. He had encountered groups like ours everywhere. 
He told us that we must continue our efforts and have hope, knowing that we were not alone, but part of a multitude of those working for peace in the world. That was before the internet, and his message, delivered in person, lifted our spirits and remained with me to lift my spirit when I felt discouraged. So I likewise urge us all to join or to recommit to working with the survivors, the Hibakshas, for the abolition of all nuclear weapons so that no one will ever again have to suffer as they have. The handout we have today <clears throat> includes the web address where you can sign on to their plea of never again. As you know, in January of this year, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight, indicating <clears throat> the dangerous situation the world faces with the threats of the climate crisis and the growing danger of nuclear war, the worst it's been since the height of the Cold War. And since then, the coronavirus pandemic and the rising political chaos in this country and elsewhere have absorbed most of the media's attention. But those two major threats to the future of the civilization on this planet still exist. It is vital to us and to the survival and future of our children's children and next generations that we strongly oppose a renewal of nuclear testing, which was recently talked about. That we support the Back from the Brink campaign and the ICANN Treaty for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. Nuclear weapons, as you know, do not make us safer. In fact, they threaten our safety. They cannot protect us from a pandemic nor from drought or storms resulting from our climate crisis. And yet Congress doesn't seem to blink at committing billions of our tax dollars annually to maintain, or almost $2 trillion to upgrade, modernize, and create more usable nuclear weapons. This is insanity. It is up to us, we the people, even in the midst of the many challenges we face regarding the pandemic, health care, racism, police violence, poverty, economic inequality, and the risks to democracy. They're all connected, and they're all overshadowed by the two great global risks to humanity's future, climate crisis and the threat of nuclear war. So to strengthen our unity of spirit, of love, compassion, empathy, and belief that we can bring forth the non-violent, sustainable, equitable world we want for our people and its, for our world and its people. We have to work. <laughs> it won't happen overnight. We know that. But we must do our part, taking every step we can. Speak out, sign petitions, make phone calls, write letters to the editor, use the digital virtual tools we have, seek truth, resist falsehoods, educate ourselves and others, and have faith, remember history, and pray for the future, however you understand prayer. As Pope Francis said in his 2017 World Day of Peace message, I plead for disarmament and for the prohibition and abolition of nuclear weapons. As Veterans for Peace member Doug Rawlings said in his poem, How to Prevent War, where are you, David? You want to read the poem? Uh, this is written by Doug Rawlings, who is the uh, president of the main chapter of Veterans for Peace. Uh, Veterans for Peace is now an international organization which was founded right here in Maine in 1985 by, among others, Doug Rawlings. So we are dedicated to the concept that war is an un unacceptable instrument of foreign policy. He starts with a Native American proverb. We have not inherited the earth from our ancestors. We have borrowed it from our, depend our descendants. And then he goes on. 
give to each president, each prime minister, each admiral, each general an acorn. Tell them to plant it where they'll never see it again. Tell them not to think about it. Rather, each morning before thoughts crowd in, tell them to feel it. To feel its roots stretching into the earth. To feel it aching toward the sun. To feel it breathing into the wind. Tell them to feel it swinging with the laughter of their children's children. As our closing prayer, we offer the prayer of Pope John Paul II at Hiroshima in February of 1981. After addressing appeals to heads of state and of government, to every man and woman in the world, to young people, to those who believe in God, he, the Pope, offered the following prayer, which I pray with you now. To the creator of nature and humanity, of truth and beauty, I pray. Hear my voice, for it is the voice of the victims of all wars and violence among individuals and nations. Hear my voice, for it is the voice of all children who suffer and will suffer when people put their faith in weapons and war. Hear my voice when I beg you to instill into the hearts of all human beings the wisdom of peace, the strength of justice, and the joy of fellowship. Hear my voice, for I speak for the multitudes in every country and in every period of history who do not want war and are ready to walk the road of peace. And hear my voice and grant insight and strength so that we may always respond to hatred with love, to <coughs> injustice with total dedication to justice, <coughs> to need with the sharing of self, to war with peace. O oh God, hear my voice and grant unto the world your everlasting peace. Thank you for your presence here today, everyone. Go forth and work for peace in a world free of nuclear weapons.